webinar, Leading with Authenticity During Challenging Times, hosted by HRDQU and presented by Dr. Carrie Bunker. Today's webinar will last around one hour. If you have any questions, you can always type them into the chat box. We will be answering questions as they come in live at the end of the presentation or as a follow-up by email. My name is Sarah Schaefer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Dr. Carrie Bunker is president of Mangrove Leadership Solutions and a founding partner of MEM Partners. Dr. Bunker is also a senior fellow and faculty member at the Center for Creative Leadership, as well as a senior fellow in human capital at the conference board. Dr. Bunker has authored and co-authored more than 550 public, public, publications, including Leading with Authenticity in Times of Transition and Leading Through Transitions. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know you all are perhaps on very different time zones and uh, I just want to add my my welcome to Sarah as part of what I'll be talking about today is how the demands of work have grown so dramatically and have placed so much uh, demand for learning and change and so I know you're all probably too busy to be on a webinar for an hour and uh, I appreciate that you have chosen to take that time to spend it with HRDQ and with, and with me uh, today. What I'm going to be talking about is something that I'm sure you're all quite familiar with and uh, one of the premises that I, that I have for you is that we know a lot about the importance of leading effectively and leading with authenticity when times are challenging and difficult. Uh, and having said that, I think that we also uh, understand that perhaps what we know doesn't always translate into what we do and, and into uh, the actual leadership skills that, that people have. So I'm going to talk about today the, the fact that the notion of incremental change as we used to know it is pretty much gone and that we're all living in a, what the military in the U.S. calls a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we're doing it in a very highly visible environment where social media has uh, a way of having everything that we do at least potentially shared with others, which uh, makes, it a very, makes it a very challenging time to be authentic as, as well as to lead and learn in a complex environment. I'd like to show you the, the agenda that I've uh, set for today and it's a quite an ambiguous one, I mean an ambitious one. Actually I'm not getting the slide to advance, Sarah, I'm not sure whether, uh, there we go. The agenda that I've set is probably uh, a bit ambitious for an hour and I want to say right up front that I, I don't have the cure for what ails you and I don't think anyone does in an hour. I actually, what I would like to do is, is talk a bit about that very issue, how much what we need to be doing to confront this kind of challenge needs to be built into the day-to-day -day environment that we live in and, and it won't come from a a quick training program or a change initiative, uh, what we can do is lay the groundwork and set things in motion for what is much more of an experiential adventure. So I'm going to talk a bit about the demand for authenticity in leading change. I'm going to talk some about what I believe are the missing ingredients for uh, making it happen. I'll spend a little bit of time linking to lessons learned primarily from large-scale work that I did uh, when I was a full-time faculty member at the Center for Creative Leadership. And part of that involved a model uh, that, in, that addresses the challenge of, a, of trying to balance some seemingly paradoxical and oppositional skills that make authenticity and change leadership come to life. And then I'll, I'll wrap up by 
uh, giving you an overview of ways perhaps to get started in your organization to make more effective change happen. I've included a graphic here of an old uh, telephone from the U.S. that uh, existed in, when I started my career at AT&T back in the 70s. And in the early 80s, the telephone system uh, in the U.S. was broken up by the government. At the time, we were the largest corporation in the world. We had a full-time working uh, staff of about a million people. And we were the most successful phone system on the planet. And we had very bright, talented people. But suddenly our world changed dramatically, and the whole notion of who we were and what we were about as an organization changed literally uh, almost overnight. And during that time, I was studying stress and was asked by the senior leadership of AT&T to quote, fix the morale problem that was uh, a consequence falling out of the breakup of, of the company. And I was told, actually, that it would be very good if I could come up with a one-day program to make this happen. And as you know, uh, it, it was a daunting task that involved uh, trying to change the heart and soul of what an organization was about. That organization, in many ways, never quite recovered from the blow that it took. And that was the beginning of a lot of the organizational dramatic change in the US and actually throughout the world. And it was a breakdown in what was the psychological contract of work. So what strikes me, and the reason I show you this, is the fact that after all of this time, uh, we know a great deal about leading change and transition, uh, but yet we haven't learned very much about what it really takes to make that happen. Many of the, of the comments that I made to our leadership about how we needed to behave differently fell on deaf ears then, and it's interesting to see how often they seem to fall on, on deaf ears now. And so what I'd like to do is just give you some examples of things that you may be hearing in the context in which you lead or try to help leaders. And just looking, at, there are many comments on this page, but what I'd like you to reflect on is, you know, to what degree do these sound typical of the world that you live in at work? The notion of constant change and uncertainty ambiguity in all aspects of, I just said, fill in the blank, whatever it might be, whatever your organization might be. I know there are a lot of friends in BC in the medical environment that are listening in today, and so filling in the blank in terms of the changing world of healthcare is one example. But everyone is running as fast as they can. People are seemingly compliant, more than committed. Uh, leadership maybe not doing a very good job on the human and emotional side. So as you read through these, I'm going to, uh, when I move to the next slide, it's going to ask you a question. It's going to say, to what degree does this describe your organization? I'd like you just to type in the chat box. You're going to see A, B, A, B, C, and D. And it's asking you, you know, are these descriptive of, of your environment or not? So just type in A, B, A, B, C, or D, about half are true. Most of them sound familiar. And I see that, that people are typing in responses here. I'm seeing Cs. I'm seeing a lot of Cs and Ds, a couple Bs. Uh, I would say the, the primary number that I'm seeing the most of is D, but I'm also seeing C, very few A's and B's. So what you're telling me is, is what I hear in most settings, and that is that all of those factors, or at least half, seem to be resonating fairly heavily with where you live. And, and hearing that, what we know is that there's a great deal of emotional context playing out for you. 
a phrase that I often use is that there's fear at your fingertips. And people may be acting resistant or, uh, you know, fearful about the changes that are coming, but fear under, is usually underneath it all. In terms of an organization trying to respond to that, I'm sure many of you have probably seen this kind of a diagram before, probably uh, from William Bridges or others, looking at the structural side, organizing the change, doing the, the necessary mechanics. But on the people side, looking at it, I like to think of it in terms of learning, and, and what people need to be doing. There is a phase of letting go, the sense of loss around things that were valued or maybe things that were rewarded, and then the resiliency part, bouncing back and relearning what people need to learn in order to move ahead. And at the core of this diagram is what I refer to as authentic leadership, being, you know, the genuine, honest, open connectivity that leaders need to have in order to, to bring these two sides of the change and transition function together into a, a cohesive leadership strategy. So I'm going to show you a, a graph that, of, uh, an image that you've maybe seen many times with some different words on it you know, using the metaphor of an iceberg and what we have on the surface are massive, relentless change initiatives. And then what's much more close to the surface is the emotional impact that this has on people. I've had CEOs tell me off and, over, off and on over the past 20 years that there's not that much emotion out there because people are used to having constant change, and so they've learned how to deal with it. Uh, I would beg to differ with that on many levels, but probably for me the most important one is this whole notion of what's underneath it all is a demand for new learning. And if I don't have you take away anything else today, I'd like you to take away the notion that at the end of the day, a lot of this is about learning and not just learning, but the unlearning and the letting go part, which is tremendously powerful for people, whether it's lifelong learning from family or prior work experience, there's uh, simply a tremendous amount of stuckness underneath this that can be quite pervasive, both at the individual level and for organizations. I, I have had organizations say to me over the past uh, odd number of years. They don't like the word stuckness. Uh, they feel it's a, a negative connotation. But in fact, if you really want to help people learn their way through, there needs to be some recognition, some awareness, some acknowledgement of the role that stuckness can play in inhibiting change. And the way stuckness emerges to the surface is generally in terms of emotions that are messy and uh, a bit difficult for us to deal with. Sometimes it comes out as resistance. Uh, personally, I don't believe that many people wake up in the morning and say, gee, I have to think of some new ways to fight this change and, and to be difficult for my, my leadership and to uh, drag my feet in change. That's, I don't think people are wired that way in general, and I don't think that's where the emotion comes from. I think it has much more to do with the unlearning and letting go, and sometimes the profound degree of stuckness that can have taken hold because of uh, past learning. So I've said this already, but I want to reinforce it. At the end of the day, it all comes down to learning. I had a, a very wise professor um, build that into my thinking back in graduate school when he said that all of psychology is, in effect, the study of learning, and that uh, if people have the ability to learn, that everything else seems to take care of itself. I believe that is especially true as we're trying to 
be effective leaders and help people develop resiliency and their ability to bounce back in the face of constant and indeed overwhelming demands for change and learning at times. Uh, that if we remember that powerful learning always involves a number of things. And I, if I ask you, if we were sitting around the kitchen table and I ask you to reflect back on powerful learning at any point in your life, I think you would tell me that in those, in those moments, one of the things that you felt were this list of some combination of positive feelings, the notion of excitement and growth and uh, doing things you didn't think you could do and reaching new heights and being appreciated and so on. But I think also if you look back, the other thing that you would pr probably tell me in those powerful life altering moments is that what you also had was the list in red, uh, the feelings of uh, fear and anxiety and stress and frustration and so on. Uh, our research at the Center for Creative Leadership was pretty clear in laying out these two dynamics. If you're having a powerful experience, you're almost always having the combination of these two uh, sets of emotions. And the truth is, you usually get the red list first. So it's the frustration and the anxiety that comes with powerful learning opportunity that you're most likely to be greeted by before you get to excitement and challenge and, and uh, feeling good about yourself. And so your challenge as a learner, your challenge as a leader trying to encourage learning in others needs to be aware uh, that you're likely to, to see the list on your left. If you're not aware of those things, if you're not uh, building that into your leadership awareness, the odds are that there's going to be a disconnect between yourself and other, other people that you're trying to bring along in the change or learning process. And I think you'll find me using those terms uh, pretty much interchangeably, change, challenge, resiliency, uh, stress, at the end of the day they all are heavily influenced by the notion of learning. And so if you're feeling like you're learning and you're not experiencing a lot of the discomfort or the stress or the uncertainty, uh, I would say maybe you're either not paying attention or you're in a bit of denial because this is what the essence of, of learning and change is all about. And so when I talk to you about uh, the ability to lead others, a concept, and I use the image of a border collie because I've, I've had several. I have one now as a pet. And they are extremely focused and very vigilant and always aware not only of where others are, but also uh, why they're where they are and what they're feeling. My, my Border Collie has incredible sensitivity to emotion. And so this, this concept, if you want to lead people somewhere new, you need to meet them where they are. And one of the corollaries of that is that they're almost never as far along as you wanted them to be. And another corollary is that you really can't slap them hard enough to make them catch up and be on your timetable. It truly is a matter of going back and picking up people where they are in order to be able to bring them to where you'd like them to be. And it's a lot about convincing them that where you want them to be actually is where they would like themselves to be. And so it's, it's guiding people along in that process, not just uh, telling them where you'd like them to be. Border Collies, as I say, are a great, a great metaphor for this. I, in this graphic, what I'd like to 
what I'd like to say to you, many of you have probably heard this over the years if you've done any work in change or transition at all. You know, we've said for years, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, in our world today, we have both the luxury and the curse of uh, constant communication and multiple ways to message each other, to uh, to dialogue that we perhaps don't use in an effective way. There are some interesting YouTube videos talking about some of the perils of our interconnected world. And one that I've looked at says in the beginning, I'm linked in to 500 people and I'm friends with another 300, but nobody knows who I am. And so communication is not enough on its own, and I would actually say to you that I think we need to rethink the notion of communicate, communicate, communicate. What we're really looking for is we need to connect, connect, connect. And so in terms of a missing ingredient in our leadership through uh, challenging times, uh, one of those one of those missing links is authentic connection with people. And many times I think we're missing the ability to connect authentically at the individual face-to-face -face level or at the face-to-face -face level with groups of people. Uh, we've relied so heavily and become so dependent at times on our ability to communicate that we completely ignore or have forgotten what it means to really connect. So I want to say that having worked with lots of leaders, both in the, in the world of individual coaching, I've, I've coached or managed coaching processes that work with C-suite level people in a wide variety of organizations across many different countries. And I would say to you that uh, one of the gaps at the senior level is that we really have not given people enough of the time they sometimes and the experience they need in order to be authentic emotional communicators. Uh, I put a sentence here, it's one sentence, but it's, it's laden with the many demands that we face in our world. Uh, the process of crafting a resilient and learning for workforce requires authentic emotional leadership from a critical mass of executives who understand the links between emotions, vulnerability, and learning. Uh, that's more than a mouthful. It, uh, it's a lifetime of experience full of development. A resilient workforce that can bounce back from adversity and re-engage and reconnect and can let go of, of past learning and admit stuckness and move on to other learning. And then this notion of having authentic, authentic leadership, you know, it's, it's more than just being uh, true to who you are. It has a lot to do with how other people see you as a leader and your ability to connect at an emotional level. And it takes a critical mass of leaders who can work together and, and be honest and open with each other. So this notion of vulnerability to learning, all of this is a very challenging uh, task for us to engage in. So I would say the bar has been raised. Uh, I like this graphic. We need to be superhuman. People want us on the one hand to be superhuman and able to inspire us and help us leap tall buildings and overcome great adversity. But on the other hand, they have an, a high need to feel like at the end of the day that we're just like them as leaders and that we understand what it feels like to be in their shoes. So the notion of being strong and tough, but at the same time empathetic, to be courageous and inspirational and at the same time to be vulnerable and open enough to admit mistakes and to own up to our own learning challenges. The need to be both uh, inspiring and passionate, 
but understanding of what it feels like on the other side to be a pillar of strength and just a regular person self-reliant yet able to trust others and trust others to know who we are and both a change agent and also someone who recognizes you know what got us here and and what we need to hang on to uh, not a small list of things for us to try to do uh, in a minute or two here I'm going to open up a poll for you and what I'm going to ask you to do just quickly as you look at the leaders however you define that as you look at leaders in your context what would what would people say about effectiveness in demonstrating authenticity not just talking about it demonstrating it and actually leading with emotional intelligence and you see your choices there from among the very best to they don't have a clue so I'm going to open up this poll now and I'd like you to to go ahead and click in uh, your responses and I'll just take a look as I see that lots of responses coming in I would say that the by far C choice C seems to be very strong we've got lots of responses in that looks like we have most everybody so let me close this poll and share it with you and you can you can see that by far uh, there's the notion that some of our leaders not too bad uh, but others have a ways to go uh, only one percent of you think you're among the very best and as you see 12 above average so we're looking at you know roughly 13 percent above average and then you've down at the bottom you know you've got 22 uh, below average and eight fully eight percent that that seemingly don't have a clue it's a bit it's a bit scary for us as we look at this kind of result but you can see that this is this is a, a demanding time for all of us and we haven't actually done a terrific job of developing uh, the leaders so the gap the major gap that I would say is that most of us and I include myself in that in that description most of us have not spent a great deal of time understanding and learning from our own emotional transitions and so we're not very pre well prepared to help others and our school systems don't do a very good job of this most of you probably did not have a course on uh, learning from emotional transition we do know from the work that we've done that people can do this and they can they can learn to be much better at this but it takes some work so here are some of the assumptions that we made as we set out to try to uh, develop some experiences that would really help people learn to be more effective as leaders and the, and some of these assumptions I've already covered the notion of authenticity and emotional leadership matters a great deal uh, it will only have impact in the organization if you're able to build some critical mass vulnerability is is key and important and I don't know how you feel but as I look at leadership challenges globally uh, in terms of our our organizations our world our, our uh, country leaderships um, vulnerability is something that's missing authenticity I would say is very challenged it does require looking inside first and readiness is is critical it doesn't matter what we say uh, to people in terms of developing these skills if they're not ready on the other hand readiness can definitely be enhanced but the learning interventions we found have to be quite powerful and as I slow, show you this next slide you'll see some of what I'm talking about here what we've learned from the interventions that we've done is that uh, you need to have you need to have some acceptance of the fact 
that there are some paradoxical demands that are at play here and that you really need to uh, find a way to get people to understand that and to work with those paradoxical demands. Uh, you need to create a very safe environment for people to explore the real impact on real people. Um, this is not a read about challenge. Uh, you don't walk away from a book with the answers. This is much more waiting in the water is how I describe it. People need to practice being emotionally open and honest with peers and colleagues. Uh, we've had great success uh, when I was at the Center for Creative Leadership doing this with large organizations including the public service, the entire public service of Canada, uh, the United States Postal Service and some other places where we really did work with a critical mass of people in very uh, very kind of deep learning experiences with each other and one of the outcomes is a recognition that others are in the same state and thereby giving each other permission to build the kind of uh, learning to learn skills and authentic openness that are required. And in the end what it's about is recreating trust with a foundation of openness and learning and developing personal resiliency. Uh, again, much easier to say than to do and what I'm going to be talking to you about in the remainder of the time that I'm presenting to you, I'm going to share with you the model that's a, that has helped us expose and uh, engage uh, leaders in this kind of paradoxical uh, learning how to learn and, uh, and being able to leverage that with others. So you're, you have some materials that have come to you uh, prior to this session and if not they will they'll be available after the session. But I'm going to talk you through a model that we used uh, to understand and to engage leaders in wrestling with these issues. And let me start by just showing you uh, this quadrant uh, uh, divided circle. If you look at the right side, these are the, the elements uh, on the softer side of leadership in challenging times. We use trust as the core of this wheel uh, because we, we think that if the, if the wheel gets out of balance, that trust is what breaks down in the end. We went into much of our work thinking that leaders were pretty good on the more core areas such as strength and commitment, but that work needed to be done and openness and learning created around emotional competence and resiliency. I just want to show you, uh, so these were the things that we were emphasizing in the work that we were doing. We wanted leaders to understand the importance of the human side of transition on the right. So being realistic and patient and understanding, being able to meet people where they are in terms of empathy and uh, as you get down into resiliency, being open and honest about what we know and don't know, uh, owning up to our own mistakes as leaders, trusting others not only to be able to contribute but to know us as real people, and then probably most importantly the ability to learn, to let go and go against the grain. Uh, in pushing these elements, what we encountered were lots of uh, reactions and pushback in terms of, yes, I understand what you're wanting us to do, but at the same time, as a leader, I have high demands on me uh, to drive the change, to foster a sense of urgency, to, be, to, be, to make the tough calls, to let people go, to restructure, to push people out of their comfort zone, to be uh, totally optimistic, to be uh, a source of self-reliance that models what other people need to do and so on. And they're, they're absolutely right about that. And so the end result is that these tend to play out against each other and they're seemingly paradoxical and unresolvable. But I just want to say uh, an important part of this is that polarization is, is absolutely the enemy of, of learning. 
and it's also the enemy of authenticity that finding a way to shift and fine-tune the balance is is what learning is all about and authenticity definitely involves being able to make the trade-offs between realism and openness and being optimistic for example that you need to do both and you uh, polarization is where learning uh, tends to be derailed the most and again if you look at our political world we are caught in the midst of dynamic polarities and polarization and there's not much authentic navigation and negotiation going on which is why we are so stuck so let me just show you quickly I don't have time to go through all of these with you but I want to give you a sense of how these dynamics play out against one another so sense of urgency versus realistic patience is probably one of the best examples and we need to do both if you think of these like spokes on a wheel you can be out of balance either direction you can overdo realistic patience you can underdo it and you can also overdo the sense of urgency or underdo it because these are opposite on the wheel the likelihood is that they tend to move together but not necessarily so let me let me just give you an example if these were operating in balance and if you think of this like a fulcrum or a teeter-totter as we call it in the US um, you have uh, trust as the fulcrum and when they're in balance what you see is that you can have a healthy amount of sense of urgency and a healthy amount of realistic patience and both are important and they tend to uh, kind of push and pull each other and you probably never get any of these polarities or these they're not in my case they're not all true polarities they actually are attributes they're paradoxical attributes and they're both important but they tend to work against each other but here you see a brief description you could write much more detail of of what a balance an effective balance might look like now you can get out of balance and you can see trust is breaking down here uh, too much is shown by pushing down too heavy on sense of urgency so you all know what that feels like everything's important everything's a priority it's impersonal people who are in the learning stages are, are blocked from having any resistance and they probably withdraw and pull away at the same time often what happens not always is that when you overdo a sense of urgency you're a little light on the other end on realistic patients and people would say you don't listen well uh, you don't know how they feel you don't show how you feel you give up on people too quickly uh, you create fear and resistance uh, so that's one direction out of balance so let's look at it the other way you can overdo realistic patience and people would probably say you're soft on people issues you know you're not really engaging the change people don't find you inspirational another descriptor is probably that you would be seen as unemployed because organizations have very little patience um, with how this uh, how this works so I'm sorry, I, I pushed something here that I apparently shouldn't have. Maybe, can you bring me back, Sarah? Thank you. So you can see how, how you can get out of balance by overdoing realistic patience, and what will often happen at the same time is on the other end you're seen as as not having enough sense of urgency and again as I say this is very common and there's not a lot of not a lot of patient patients for that in our organizations so what I want to share with you is that you can do the same thing for any any of these opposing pairs on the wheel so if you look at driving the change versus understanding the emotional impact if you have the handout that has the anchors on it you'll see on the first page of that handout 
that it has a description of capitalizing on strengths at the top and going against the grain on the bottom. And you can uh, flip through and find uh, each of these as they're talked about. They may not be in the exact order that I'm showing them to you here, but you can see that you have catalyzing change versus coping with transition. And then you have the one that I shared with you already, sense of urgency versus realistic patience. Here's a big one, being tough and being empathetic. It's, it's, very, it's very challenging to uh, be understanding and to meet people where they are and at the same time to make the tough calls that you have to make in times of rapid change or, or challenging and extraordinary times. And so being able to uh, look at yourself and be honest and to help others do the same and to see whether or not you're getting out of balance being too tough, missing, missing the boat on empathy and so on. You're looking at driving commitment and making an urgent commitment to the organization to drive change on the one hand and meeting people where they are in the emotional competence sense on the other side. So let's take a look at the others here. If you're looking at in the strength category versus resiliency, one of the things you hear most often is, is leaders saying, I have to be optimistic for people. If I'm not a source of optimism and energy, I'll lose them. And so uh, I need to always be optimistic. Sometimes if you overdo that and you underdo realism and openness, uh, people start to describe you as Pollyanna or clueless, uh, disconnected, uh, in an extreme case, it might say you just don't you don't get it. Uh, that can undermine uh, the trust that that people have in you. Self-reliance versus trusting others. And again, uh, we see lots and lots of leaders who are burned out at both ends, often from their own push to do things by themselves and not trust others. And then the whole notion of going against the grain and, and creating new learning versus capitalizing on the strengths that we already have. Lots of, lots of pressure and complexity in that. So if you look at this wheel, you can, there's no perfect answer to this, but if you look at the yellow area, uh, that's overdone. The green, I mean the gray solid circle, inner circle, is the about right, and you can overdo or underdo any of these in either direction. They don't necessarily move together. For example, I've seen people who are rated as too tough and too empathetic at the same time. Uh, we might have time to talk about that later, but probably not much. Uh, but you can see that uh, these can get out of whack. This is kind of an extreme example of an organization or an individual. We've plotted organizations uh, where there is a tendency to overdo a lot on the left and underdo on the right. What I'd like you to do, just based on the limited knowledge that you have of these concepts now, I'm, I'm going to open this poll and what I'd like you to think about as you Look at these pairs of attributes. I left out, because we had a limit of five, I left out urgency and patience because uh, the data we have suggests that urgency is often, that particular balance is often uh, out of whack and out of balance in the direction of too much of a sense of urgency. So I'm giving you a choice on these other five. What I'd like you to do, I'm going to open this poll and I'd like you to pick uh, the pair that you think is most out of balance uh, with leadership in your organization. Now keep in mind that uh, you might have two or three of these pairs that are out of balance and that the poll doesn't necessarily allow you to show which direction, and it is important to know if they're out of balance, uh, which direction is probably um, 
most uh, most symptomatic of your organization. So it looks like most of the responses are in. I'm going to I'm going to share this with you. And as you can see, there's there's a mix here. Again, I would tell you that sense of urgency in realistic patients probably would be near the top of the list. Uh, but driving change versus recognizing the emotional side and being tough versus being empathetic. Uh, those two are adjacent on the wheel, if you remember looking at the wheel. And pairs that are adjacent to each other often have a tendency to vary together. So as you can see here, if you look at the combination of driving change hard and not wrestling with the emotional issues and also being tough and not having enough empathy, which is the direction I suspect you're probably reflecting here, uh, that can be a very powerful force for getting in the way of the very change that you're trying to make. And so these, this is a fairly typical response. Uh, it's interesting if you look at capitalizing on strengths versus going against the grain that it appears that, that you're doing um, in, in your organizations a, a decent job of finding balance on these. Now these can at, at certain times you may want to emphasize one side versus the other. For example, in the, short, the very short term you might want to drive urgency and change very hard. Uh, and maybe even get a little out of balance on purpose to get people's attention if they've been stuck in not uh, dealing with change in the past. But for me, as uh, one of the co-authors of this work, uh, my opinion has always been that out of balance is out of balance and overdue is always overdue. And so while you might want to be out of balance for a short period of time, uh, you need to find ways to get back in balance in order to uh, make things happen. So let me uh, take you to the to the next thing here. What I want to do is say to you just quickly. Uh, I believe this work requires face-to-face uh, -face intervention and waiting in the in the water, as I said earlier. Uh, there's a package that we created. There are some packaged materials for one and two day facilitated learning that we have found to be uh, very effective in getting uh, small groups of people within an organization to engage and to start wrestling with the complexity of what's involved here. And I just want to show you quickly what the one and two day uh, versions of this look like. Uh, I also will say to you that we created this literally to try to be a a standalone set of materials for you that has everything from a facilitator's guide that almost tells you word for word if you need it what what to say and how to introduce each of the activities and to get people engaged and what's important to make it happen. Uh, I will also in all honesty tell you that it's that it's challenging and you need to prepare yourself and there are suggested pre-readings that you need to do and um, People like myself are available to do help you do train the trainer, whatever. But it it it's the kind of thing that you really are uh, trying to engage people at an emotional level and get them to wrestle with this. And and it takes uh, it takes some preparation, it takes some inside out learning by the facilitators, it it takes experienced uh, facilitators to do this kind of work. But in, if you look, this is a two-day agenda, but what would happen in the one-day version is you would not do day two, essentially. Uh, the, the material takes you into the kind of introduction to change and transition in more depth than we did uh, in this session. And then there are activities at multiple times, including getting people to look at what their experience has been in people that are ineffective or effective in this kind of work. And then looking at uh, the timeline in your own organization. How, is, how has the organization learned and evolved and what, what has worked and what hasn't. And then at an individual level, accessing in your own lifetime the powerful learning events that you've had and leveraging those to get at your own authenticity and your own ability to learn and to put you in touch with each other around 
what it takes to uh, work together in an authentic way. And then an understanding of the essential principles of making this work and dealing with some back home experience. What is it, what is it really like in our organization? That's an, an openness experience that we have found links people to the demands of deep stuckness and letting go and learning to learn. It's a way of really connecting leaders at a very personal level to get them to, uh, to understand how that works. In day two, there's a lot about resiliency and looking at your own experience with resiliency. What, is, what does it mean to be able to bounce back from adversity? There's some solid theoretical uh, work that's built into that experiential activity. And then some in-depth work around the paradox wheel model that I just shared with you. Uh, it then goes into the notion of how do you assess for yourself or your organization where you are, where you've been, where do you need to go, where is our stuckness, where is my personal stuckness, uh, then some application in terms of planning and developing and doing small group uh, consulting. So uh, this is uh, something that's available. I'm going to uh, turn this back to Sarah. I, I just want to thank you again for, for participating here, and, and Sarah has a few words to say to you. All right, great. Thank you so much. And we actually do have some time for you to answer some of your questions. Um, so attendees, why don't you go ahead and use your chat window to send us those now. And while we wait for those questions to come in, let me just share a little bit more about the program that is the foundation of today's session. And that is, Leading Through Transitions comes from the expert minds at the Center for Creative Leadership. It's a comprehensive real-world real training program that provides leaders with skills and the confidence they need to be effective while facing unrelenting change. And as always, you can always use that coupon code you will receive in the email after the ses session to shop at hrdqstore.com. Okay, and it looks like we do have a number of questions coming in, so why don't we go ahead and get started. It looks like our first question is coming from Carl, and he wants to know, if there is no perfect wheel or person, what situations drive the necessity to either overdo or underdo an attribute? Okay, I, yes, I, I mentioned this briefly in passing. I would say the most, the most common situation might be when an organization has been stuck under, uh, under a leadership that perhaps did not want to change and, and uh, was uh, being out, outpaced by the changing environment or by other competitors. In the short term, in order to make a point, sometimes an organization will bring in a, a, a transition or a change uh, innovator to try to stimulate uh, and energize and create movement. Sometimes in that process, uh, it's appropriate to overdo, as I said, the sense of urgency and perhaps driving change and pulling people out of their comfort zone. Uh, what, we've, what we've seen, however, is in the long term, when you bring in these change agents sometimes, they lock onto this, uh, driving people in an overdue mode. And sometimes if you're unrelenting in that, people might just withdraw or, or become totally resistant. So I, for me, it's, uh, you know, there are times where you may want to uh, try to create some sort of initiative where you might overdo some of these and underdo others. But uh, and, and our experience has been if you're overdoing uh, being tough, for example, that you, you really need to be attentive to the empathy side too. So you push people hard, but you do it in a supportive and learningful way. Okay, perfect, thank you. And it looks like our next question is coming from Mallory. Are there specific challenges for women leaders? 
I, you know, I think there are, and and uh, I think we all actually, you know, there are some some of these threads that are common uh, for all of us, whether we, you know, for all genders, for all, uh, you know, for all ethnic backgrounds, for all uh, different cultures, and so on. There are some there are some common threads that run through all of these. Certainly, I think on on the gender side, sometimes uh, there is. Uh, some maybe some preconceived perception about whether women may be, for example, more effective on the empathy side uh, and maybe more at risk of overdoing uh, on on some of the emotional intelligence side or underdoing on on the opposite of those. I think those are mostly perceptions, and I think people need to be aware of some of the stereotypes. I don't think it has as much to do with ability as it has to do with with stereotypes and and preconceived notions. All right, thank you. And our next question is coming from Donald. Should all companies seek to be in the gray zone on the wheel? For example, a call center seek to have a different emphasis to a research institute. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I I and my co-author Michael Wakefield might disagree with me a bit on this issue. I, I, you know, I think trying to strive toward balance on the gray side, on the gray part of the wheel, is important because, as I say, I think over time, overdue is overdue and underdue is underdue, regardless of whether you're in a call center or you're face to face. Um, I think sometimes, you know, we we feel like we have to treat people differently because of the context. But I think what we're really talking about here is authentic connection with people. And what I've seen in situations where they said, well, they're not face-to-face. -face. Uh, we don't need to worry about it as much. It's just about output and, and meeting, meeting numbers and so on. Underneath it all, those perceptions of what people see when you're out of balance still tend to play out over time and I, th I think that may have a sometimes it has a festering impact on an organization it may not be so visible but I think over time being out of balance now none of us let's be honest none of us including myself are in the gray zone on all phases of this wheel at any one time I, the number of organizations or individuals we've encountered with perfect circles is about zero. Um, you know, you see some organizations that are better balanced than others, but in reality, you know, we're always we're all learning. We all have our gaps that we're trying to work on. Okay, great, thank you. And looks like we probably have time for just one more. And this one is coming from Tina. How impactful is a first impression as compared to a longer term view? How long to overcome a shifted first impression? Excellent question. Uh, first impressions, as you know, are very strong, and we all we all are uh, adept at and guilty of perhaps making first impressions. And again, as I said, so a leader who comes in and is just learning, I've had a number of people at the CEO level who, prior to coaching, there were strong perceptions of their inability or their, or their uh, uh, the sense that they were out of balance in a bad way on some of these scales uh, was very strong and to the point where I remember one person saying, if this person becomes CEO, we're doomed and I'm out of here. Uh, working with that person in a concentrated kind of way, there were a lot of things that had to literally be worked on to be overcome and a lot of it involved initiating, getting out of your comfort zone making time to make direct communications, owning up to past uh, mistakes or being out of balance or whatever, and, and consciously making the effort to reach out and connect. I can't overemphasize connect, 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 and recognizing that people are in learning mode, including yourself. And so sometimes uh, I think one of the keys is just acknowledging that you're in learning mode and engaging people to travel with you in the journey is probably one of the most important things that we emphasize is that 
people connect with that. Again, it's part of that, you're superhuman, but you're just like me. And the just like me part is when you start to uh, break down some of those first impressions. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. And um, would you just like to add any final thoughts? Um, just I, I, I want to thank all of you again for making the time to be to be part of the webinar today. I know uh, uh, there's no answer in an hour. I hope I've engaged you in the thinking. I would encourage you to uh, look in more depth at the handout materials that you have and uh, and to take the opportunity at the rate that, that uh, HRDQ is offering some of these materials to explore them and uh, and to really give some thought to making new initiatives in your own organization. Okay, perfect. Well, Carrie, thank you so much again. And if we did not get time to answer your questions, you will receive an emailed response probably early next week. So we really appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webinar informative.